everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Lunch with a Trojan, part of our Tunnel Vision program family, I guess you could say. We got the old P, Petros Papadakis, here on the show. Petros, thanks for uh, joining us, man. It's my pleasure, and uh, thanks for having me. And uh, why is it special? Is it more special than normal? Uh, it's pretty special when you got a, a legend <laughs> like you coming on here. Come on, man. Like, I don't. I, uh, so we do appreciate you you coming on here. You can follow him on Twitter at the old P. Uh, also, Petros and Money Show uh, on Twitter. You can AM five seventy here in Los Angeles with the Petros and Money Show. But he also does work with a lot of Fox Sports. I guess that family of stations doing uh, college football. Uh, analysis. So, uh, yeah, you can find P all over the place here in LA. Yeah, I'm uh, still working. <laughs> Since 2000, very grateful. I've been with the same entity, basically Fox Sports, since 01, and uh, been doing the Petros and Money Show on iHeartRadio, which it used to be Clear Channel. Uh, that since uh, that's about 15 years now. So oh, wow. very, very blessed and very grateful. And getting old, you know, in front of everybody in the city, <laughs> just like you. But it's, you look good. Oh, thanks. So do you. Yeah, I Ryan want... asked me when we were prepping for this and, you know, getting the lights right so I don't look like too bad like a vampire. <laughs> uh, even though I do, Ryan's like, uh, so you keeping healthy? Like, uh, you know, I'm sure you don't ask like, you know, a Dory Jackson or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've known, we've known each other a long time. I mean, it's, it's funny when you think about that, because like I first met you, I mean, when you were at USC and I think I was, we might've talked about this when you came in the studio. I think I was like your first like post football playing interview. And then when you started to get into, I came into the, your dad's restaurant, the Papadakis Taverna, and we did like a long interview there Jeez. and uh, way back when. So this had to be, well, yeah, like, I mean, it was a long time ago, but. I probably sounded like a huge jackass. No, that no, you were. Pretty different. <laughs> you were always great. People, so, um, yeah, I, I wanted to have you on the show anyway, but then we've had some little, I don't know if snipes, like you kind of take a few snipes at me on Twitter and stuff. Oh, and it's so all, like, uh, we, and I know, that's what people are like. I'm like, look, Petros and I like, I think he still likes me. I don't know, but it wasn't a, a thing. I love me. everybody. I'm, I'm a loving person. I'm not a, I'm really not an angry guy the way uh, sometimes I sound. You know, I'm very loud and have a giant face and, uh, that sometimes I don't really realize, you know, how I'm coming off. But uh, no, no, it's all love. Of course, I have my platforms, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't begrudge anybody, especially at their success, their fandom, or their enthusiasm for uh, whatever's going on. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm a libertarian in many ways. Yeah. Well, we had you in the studio last year. Uh, there was the Beachlight Festival, I think, yeah. we were promoting. Uh, did you do that remotely this year? Was uh, it like we did, a they did like a speakeasy uh, okay. thing where we had different bands on. It was pretty cool, actually. A uh, guy from the Foo Fighters, people oh. like that. A uh, guy from Unwritten Law, you know, different bands. And, uh, the, and Jimmy from... Uh, you know everybody, all the South Bay music people, uh, Jimmy from Pennywise. And it was cool. Uh, I, I did it like this from the house. And, you know, they screamed at me the whole time, like, throw it to this, throw it to that. You know, but it was a, it was a fun experience. And uh, I hope we get back to it because it really was a, a cool thing. You know, being from the South Bay uh, my whole life, uh, it's really, really gratifying to see uh, Willie Nelson playing in the Redondo Beach Marina with the backdrop of, of a place that we all love. Uh, and, you know, everybody's there enjoying a show and not as many phones, you know, filming it because it's people that are our age. Uh, so uh, it was really it, it really was a great event. And I hope that I know they have a contract. So uh, I, I hope to be doing it again soon when yeah, we can. Yeah, when we get back to normal, which is I don't know if we're ever going to be back to normal. I mean, you guys, you, you, know, you guys are on the radio hours every day. Um, first it's the COVID-19 stuff. You talk about sports yeah. every day. That's gone. Like the beach life festival is gone. Then you have the, the, you know, the George Floyd murder happens and you know, the, the country has been going crazy. There's a lot of, uh, you know, understandable outrage and all that. How do you address, I mean, maybe both parts of it where you're not talking really about sports that are happening. And then with the, all the, everything that's been going on just the last few days, especially in the city. Yeah. Uh, and we're right in the middle of the ladder, you know, and, uh, Yesterday, I can't lie to you, I was really nervous, you know, before we went on the air. I've been doing it a while. You know, the first uh, year I started doing radio and TV was 2001, which was obviously 9-11. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, I was like two weeks into my media career. You couldn't call it a career then. My career was just a waiter at the Taverna. So uh, that was crazy, you know, and I think that helped me through a lot of different things. And, and I have a very strong radio partner uh, in tone and being tonally appropriate, which is I, a lot of people that are watching this are probably laughing. But it is something I think about because I am kind of a goofy guy, especially on the radio. So when something's going on and people are hurting, I mean, just think about this year. We had the Kobe Bryant tragedy. Yeah. We had uh, we had obviously the pandemic, and now we have this this social unrest, which many of us from Los Angeles remember uh, from 1992. And I remember, you know, being on the roof of the Taverna and my dad and everybody freaking out. And, you know, manhole covers going through the windows. And I remember what those conversations were like with my teammates, you know, back then and uh, in the locker room and OJ and all the different stuff we used to talk about. And it's very interesting because uh, now a lot of those conversations are on social media. Yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff that I heard said, you know, 30 years ago uh, from guys and saw, you know, with my own eyes and my own experience, you know, being around primarily black guys, uh, as a college football player, especially, and uh, growing up where I did, not as many, uh, not as much diversity, but down at the restaurant, which was five minutes, you know, from our house where we basically grew up, you know, we were exposed to a lot of different things. So uh, the conversation doesn't feel new, you know, and I think we can, I can lean on my experiences as a young person. Certainly don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, and. Uh, try to have as much empathy as possible. You know, first, when it comes to the COVID thing, you know, it's a wild deal because I've always kind of felt like, you know, for better or worse, I have a lasso or kind of like a, 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 a chain of truth, you know, at least in my mind, over a situation. Like, I feel like I know what's happening. And that helps me communicate, you know, in our job. Uh, that one, I don't. You know, I, there's a lot of people I love and trust that think I'm crazy for going into the studio every day. And I go into the studio because the show doesn't sound good if you're not in the studio. You know, you know that. Uh, <laughs> and you hear these shows that aren't in the studio and they sound bad. So, you know, we go in the studio, we're together. They emptied out the building and we've been doing that for three months. I've been driving to Burbank every day. Uh, so, uh, and I have people I love and trust that really, really thought that was a bad idea. I have people that think I'm crazy when I wear a mask, you know, into a store, yeah. you know, and those are people I love and trust too. And, you know, I'm usually like always drowning somewhere in the middle. And uh, it's, uh, that was a frustrating one. This one, you know, uh, it's, it's not easy to be humorous about this kind of stuff, but, you know, police chases, uh, J.R. Smith stalking a dude on the street, you know, different stuff like that. You can pull little threads and just try to get people through their day. You know, on our radio station, we're really lucky because we have KFI, you know, right down the hall and KFI covers news. I mean, some of their shows uh, are opinion shows, just like any network, but the news people at KFI led by Chris Little and Steve Gregory and Robin Bertolucci, their program director and their, uh, their GM, uh, it is, they're absolutely impeccable. And we can draw from them. We have updates from them. We can uh, send people down there if they need the latest on public safety and health. So uh, it's an advantage. And, you know, over the years, you know, kids get shot at, at Saugus High. You know, it's hard to come on the air and, you know, play your clown horn, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, we've that's been our experience over the years. And that's why, we you know, we're paid to try to have the right tone in situations like this. And, you know, before the show started yesterday, I didn't know what our show was going to be like. You know, and I don't know what our show is going to be like today. Mick Cronin's coming on uh, right in the middle of the three o'clock hour. He has a message. Uh, he's a really powerful speaker and a great yeah. guy. Uh, and we'll go from there, you know. But uh, it is an interesting time, you know, to do it. But I do feel confident and qualified. Like once this whole thing started, like I knew what we had to do. I don't want to be the guy predicting when sports are coming back or, you know, who's right or who's wrong. I try to be the guy that brings people through on the radio side of this stuff with humor and with, uh, with, you know, camaraderie. We're a really inclusive show. You know, if you come to our events, you know, we get three, 400 people and, you know, we get guys that run hedge funds and, 
you know, uh, people that are unemployed and everywhere in between of every race, uh, creed and culture. And we pride ourselves on that, you yeah. know. That's how my dad's restaurant used to look, you know, uh, on a Saturday night when he looked around the room. So uh, for for us, you know, I feel like we know what to do and we just have faith in our abilities to, to do it. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, there's been so much, I guess I've been encouraged by, I mean, seeing protesters that are, you know, peaceful, taking a knee with a sheriff or like Anthony Lynn had something in the LA times today. That was great. Like Herm Edward, like all the different, you know, kind of people you look up to in the sports world. A lot of people have just said great things. What have you felt that reaction has been like? And have you liked the reaction from, you know, maybe the PAC 12 and USC specifically, it seems like everyone's doing a pretty good job, like saying the right stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, some people, what some people's virtue signaling is some people's, uh, grandstanding is some people's, a uh, great, uh, wonderful, powerful statement, you know, and I fall, you know, uh, we tried to get Anthony Lynn on the show yesterday because we knew he'd have something uh, really important to say. And uh, we're working on him uh, later in the week. Uh, if you're a college football coach, you know, your job is to help, like a big part of your job is to help young African-American men. You know, that's a huge part of, uh, of what high school coaches do, you know, getting, 12 guys, you know, for every guy that goes to SC or University of Washington or LSU, I love the programs like Narbonne under Manny Douglas when he was there, or Sarah, which is a private school, but Scott Altenberg, you know, they get five guys going to Dixie State, you know, or going to Southern Oregon, you know, guys you might not hear about on, on uh, the news, but, you know, those guys have a chance and they're going to school. So, you know, I understand uh, all the messages. I'm encouraged like you, you know, when I saw because in 92, I didn't see any cops kneeling with protesters. No. You, know, you, you didn't see that type of thing. Or you didn't, you know, I remember the Rodney King message, which was a message of unity, which is a lot like George Floyd's brother's message, you know, which was a message of unity. And uh, I mean, I remember a lot of those conversations. And I hope we're farther along. Uh, but a lot of it for me, you know, feels the same. It's a real conversation. It's been a real conversation about the police and this country for, you know, over 100 years. And uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. It feels new to young people, I'm sure, like it did to me in 1992. But it didn't feel new to the people, you know, from the 60s who saw the Watts riots. Uh, I guess the biggest difference is the riot or the riots or the uh, unrest or the protest. They did not go above the tent when when we were younger. You know, oh, they, yeah. never, they never went up there. And that's why, uh, I mean, and it was because there was a peaceful protest in Pan Pacific Park, and then it splintered from there. And we got, you know, John Cusack running around with his phone and, you know, J.R. Smith, you know, socking people on the streets. You know, that didn't happen in 92. In 92, you know, guys like Reginald Denny were getting pulled out of their car right. and having, you know, just unspeakable things happen. And it was happening all over the city to, to people of all races. So, uh, yes, that I think that is a little bit different and more encouraging. Um, during the weekend, I felt pretty, pretty discouraged. Yeah. But again, you know, for a guy like me, it's a time for empathy and just to try to help people kind of to move on through it and uh, hear what people are saying and, and hope for for some kind of change. But I also come from the perspective of a small business owner and, you know, uh, people that, you know, dependent on a small business. And we had one restaurant. It was our whole livelihood. You know, and and uh, it's tough to see people's businesses threatened. You know, especially small businesses owners, yeah. small business owners. It's hard to transition from that, but we want to talk. Uh, you know, one football. thing is true, though. I do want to oh, say just sure. people be better. You know, we in '92, you looked out the window, the city was on fire. Yeah, I was you at know, USC at the time. I mean, it yeah. was burning and, all around me. Yeah, and that's not happening. You know, right. the media does a great job of covering it, but you know, it also gives people kind of a, a different idea of what's actually going on. Most of the protests are very peaceful. Yeah. Um, well, you came, uh, I, I mean, I've been thinking of you for a while, but the, uh, you went on to Colin Cowherd's show uh, over the weekend, and I thought it was, you know, really good. There was kind of a whole segment, I guess you could say, of the USC talk, and uh, so I want people to check that out. Oh, let me put up a picture of you guys uh, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like that I'm one? I'm going to eat him. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's like mimicking you, what's going yeah, on. We're having a, uh, we're having a stare down. Nice. Uh, They're mad I didn't dress up. God, look at my gullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in better shape now, I think. Okay. Um, but we, when we were coming on, we were talking about, um, you know, both of us, when I started the website, you know, I was like, it was kind of a hobby and became a real business. And now it's my livelihood. 
during the Pete Carroll era. And like your kind of broadcast career sort of happened along the, the same way. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, and to get it, to get there, uh, you know, a friend of mine, a, a great friend to, to sports and writing and, and literature. I mean, and I don't use that word lightly, but one of the great writers in the history of our city, Chris Dufresne, passed away. Yeah. And uh, Chris Dufresne was an inspiration to me, you know, when I had no idea what I was doing on the old 1540, the ticket, you know, there was a lot of people that helped me. Uh, Gary Paskowitz, you know, I know somebody that you value a lot, uh, won't being one of them, but uh, Chris Dufresne uh, passed away last week and we were remembering him and, and just how great he was with college football. And we had Bill Plasky on the show and Bill said, you know, uh, I, you know, he started the college football craze. You know, he started the West Coast college football craze. And I thought back and, you know, my career started in 01. And obviously when you're playing at USC, you live in a bubble where USC football is the most important thing in the world and there's nothing else. And that was really before the internet took off and social media. So, you know, I didn't live in a world from when Pete Carroll kind of took over till pretty deep into my career into Kiffin and all that. That's not me, by the way. Uh, was it not? That's the punter. Come on. <laughs> that's the I, freaking punter, Ryan. I know. That's the punter. I know. I know. That was a little, my little job. Back was, at you. That's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> it does come uh, up though when you Google your name, that one comes yeah, up. That's, that's, that's a white guy in 35. Okay. I know. Sorry about that. Uh, I thought it'd be funny. Christ almighty. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I didn't know anything other than, you know, until like Kiffin was like into his mid career at SC as the head coach, like the USC football has got to be, is the biggest deal in the world. Yeah. And now, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, everybody used to call me to talk USC football all the time. It's not as popular as it used to be. You know, it's over in a lot of ways. And it's been that way for a decade. And obviously there's a lot of reasons for it. I don't know how deep you want to get into it. But it really has been a slow kind of deflating of a balloon, you know, ever ever since Lane with yeah. a couple of bright spots, you know, like Sam Darnold or, or the Matt Barkley year. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, for me, I'm a guy like, uh, like Bill said, West Coast football, you know, when I left doing the USC radio gig, which was right after they won the Rose Bowl and claimed uh, half the championship, uh, I started doing national games for for uh, the regionals on Fox. You know, we did now SC Fresno State game. You know, the the game with Marshawn Lynch driving the thing. You know, the game with Barry Tompkins. I did that for ten years and was so grateful to have that job. And and it was the Pac-10 game of the week. And I fell in love with the conference doing that. You know, I fell in love with all these other places that need USC to be great in order for them to be healthy. You know. And it really is one of the two things, uh, primary things that's wrong with West Coast football is that USC is not competing nationally on the field, you know, and, and that's, you know, your business is it, recruiting, reporting, and that's always, you know, with the exception of last year, that's always a lucrative thing for USC. It never hasn't been. Uh, their problem has been player development, clearly. Yeah. And, uh, and it kills the West Coast. It's one of the ter it's it's the only quick fix we have for West Coast football is to immediately make USC football relevant again. And I'm not talking about with all due respect. And it's your work. I mean, this is a fan site. You know, it's your job to celebrate USC football. We have a little fun going back and forth, but this is a fan site. You know, people that come here want to see, for the most part, USC football celebrated. You know, Gary Paskowitz. It was is one of my dearest friends, God rest his soul. You know, I understood his work. You know, I get it. What really offends me is when the local media is starting to kind of acquiesce because they're getting some access and they're also operating like a fan site. That's offensive uh, to me, but we can get into that. But overall, you know, for me, if USC football's sick, the West Coast is sick. USC football is sick. They have been for a long time. The quick fix is a relevant head coach, a la Bob Stoops or all the people that were rumored to have gone down the road with Mike Bone in this weird black hole of a purgatory time, you know, before uh, 
before the end of the season and before the Holiday Bowl when USC decided to keep Clay Helton. They were really talking to real head coaches. And if Bob Stoops is the SC head coach, you know, you hire Bob Stoops, not just because it's Bob Stoops. Bob Stoops goes and finds Lincoln Riley because he's not scared of a great coordinator uh, at an ECU. You know, uh, make the arguments you want for Graham Harrell. That's not the same offense. You know, it, it really isn't. And to me, you know, it doesn't work at a power school like USC. We can talk about that, too. Yeah. Uh, you hire Urban Meyer. What does Urban Meyer do? You know, he's not he's not too proud to hire real assistants or to have the, the, the gavel taken out of his hand so somebody else can try to hire real assistants. You know, Urban went and dug out Tom Herman, you know, Ryan Day, Alex Grinch, you know. I mean, the list goes on and on. You don't just hire those coaches because it's that guy. But, yeah, you get immediate respect. You get all your national games back. Suddenly, when USC has Washington State visit at the Coliseum or something, it's a national game in prime time. And you you revitalize West Coast football just by doing that. Now, there's a whole bunch of other problems it'll take that they probably are not uh, solvable at this point because the value of the conference has plummeted yeah. because of Larry Scott's leadership so, so grossly. But, you know, it's not... It's it's really hard for me this offseason to kind of go through the tiresome motions of the celebration of, you know, this small victory and that small victory. And the media blitz, clearly, that the USC Athletic Department is trying to put, you know, with positivity into the air. Uh, and I understand that, you know, they need to build some bridges. <laughs> I mean, the, the last three athletic directors, you know, pissed a lot of people off. Uh, one of them lost control of his athletic department. And that's why they haven't hired any coaches that have control since Pete Carroll, because he took the control from Mike Garrett and it led to horrible, horrible uh, sanctions for the school. I mean, that's what happened. They couldn't control Pete and things, things dissipated from there. And ever since then, you can't, they haven't hired a coach that is allowed to bring in his own staff, really, that's allowed to pay his own staff that you know has a call on who gets to sit in the plane and that's why usc to me has kind of become like a gray gardens you know it's this beautiful house on the hill that's rotting from the inside out and a bunch of aristocrats going crazy on the inside running around sending tweets you know they get on the field and they get their ass knocked off the ball you know by the alabamas the ohio states you know the teams they're supposed to be competing with on the field i mean it's almost a joke when we've seen it and to me, you know, there's no quick fix for that with this head coach. And I don't know how to make it any clearer, yeah. you know. No. And, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be mean, you know, but, I mean, I, I remember the celebration of T. Martin as an offensive genius and a great recruiter. You know, where's T. Martin? You know, I mean, we go through this every year. And programs do that, I get it. But at a certain point, you know, Enough has got to be enough for USC fans. And I think they're way past critical mass, you know. Uh, and it's unfortunate, not just for SC, but, you know, for everybody in the conference. Yeah, I think that the, you can tell the peristyle, like our message board, the tone of it. I mean, the last couple of years, it, obviously, it's been bad. And it was hard. Once they brought in an, an athletic director, when they bring in Mike Bone, um, some people are like, oh, maybe this is, you know, hopeful because you actually have a, an experienced athletic director as opposed to a former football player. They've hit a bunch of, I think they've hit a bunch of signals, singles. They've, they've done some good things, but yeah, like you said, they're still a pretty big problem. Do you find, have you found like, well, you know, I could see how this would work. Like they just hired like Chris Claiborne and Hayes Pillard, you know, yeah. kind of small wins like that. Do you get any optimism for USC fans seeing some of the things that have been happening lately, I guess? One, with all due respect to Hayes, who I really like and was a great player, uh, I didn't like the double celebration of, look at these two guys. You know, Chris Claiborne's one of the great defensive players in the history of the university. Yeah. You know, he, he, didn't play, uh, he didn't play in the most lucrative time for USC football, but believe me, <laughs> I've seen that guy do superhuman things against the best of the best. You know, whatever happened in his pro career, uh, and he played in the NFL for, 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 for quite some time. But uh, Chris is really one of the greatest football players I've ever been on the field. Like He was really special and a great leader and a great teammate. And I love Chris Claiborne. You know, I, I didn't like seeing the double highlight film because to me that's like, you know, putting uh, Ronnie Lott 
and, uh, you know, name a safety, you know, Cleveland Coulter on the same level. You know, they're both good. They're not, the, you know, not really the same. I love Cadillac Cleveland Coulter, but, you know, uh, and he was good, but he wasn't Ronnie Law. No. Uh, so anyway, yes, like, look, USC, as you know, because you cover all the little things, was way behind yeah. uh, as far as just having uh, the right recruiting set up having enough people to actually do the work of a big time program, you know, which was part of the archaic stubborn nature of a bunch of people that still wanted control. And a lot of those people are still there. Let's be clear, you know, let's be honest. Uh, Mike Bone got hired. Most people figured for one thing and he didn't do it. And now they've set up a structure to where if Clay Helton, who doesn't seem to have any power anymore uh, is fired, uh, which maybe could have happened right after the uh, Holiday Bowl, because that was a blowout, uh, then Graham Harrell is suddenly your head coach, or Todd Orlando. You know, nobody knows what promises were made to those guys. And uh, I know Todd Orlando from, from doing Texas games. And I respect him as a coach, but, you know, y- y- you, didn't, you didn't just hire Venables either, you know. And I think that's – media gaslighting and over-celebration. I remember when Clancy Pendergast was peddled as a great innovator of defense and, you know, all these things were said about him. And you know what? There was a time in my career when he was at working at Cal that I thought Clancy Pendergast was a great defensive innovator. You know, this stuff is all circular and it doesn't mean the guy coached. I just, I am always a temperer of hype, you know? Yeah. And, you know, to me, it's like, okay, Great. You have some coordinators that you're paying so like a more uh, comparable salary, not really comparable to what a guy like uh, Bob Stoops was going to bring in. But you have these coordinators that you're paying uh, better. You've hired some from film guys. You, you have a recruiting department that's a little better. You know, you have an athletic director that, you know, can actually, uh, however, if you like it or not, you know, shape a message and and bring a message to the media and has the energy to do a bunch of interviews and, you know, is not a country club snob, you know, Hall of Famer country club snob. And that's what we've had, you know, and those aren't ADs, you know, those people can't administrate. Uh, And that was a big problem, clearly. So, you know, those are steps, but, you know, to me, it it doesn't get USC off the mat. Uh, And it doesn't really help the perception of West Coast football you know, at all, you know, despite, you know, whatever puff pieces are written and then they are. And, you know, that's what this time of of year is about. But, you know, I resent a lot. And and Mike Bone is, look, the LA Times ruined USC, right? Not just the football program. I mean, the LA Times shot a harpoon in the university. They did with the Pulafito scandal, with the, uh, the, the gynecologist, which was awful uh, scandal. You know, I have family members involved in that. Uh, you know, my whole family, we've, we've lived this. You know, all these terrible things that have happened that make the athletic department problems look minuscule. You know, the LA Times did that. And whether Mac Nikias is still on campus or not, you know, that's probably an issue. But the fact that somebody at the LA Times at the LA Times and somebody at USC is building a bridge is not a bad thing. You know, my thing about the beat writer, Ryan Karchi is, you know, I don't mind you making out with Mike Bone, you know, just button your shirt up when you come out of the office, you know, don't make it so obvious, you know, you know, I mean, just a a little bit, a little bit of a, a little bit of both sides, you know, Uh, and, or write about a player, you know, I don't want to read a seven page documentary about an assistant athletic director as if that's going to get fans excited about. I mean, my God in heaven, you know, uh, that kind of stuff is the. Oh, we lost Petros for a second there. Uh, Let's see. I'll put you here. Uh, Hopefully he's okay. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Let me see if we can get him back. I'll send him a text real quick. Well, he's a he's a fiery guy, as you know. Um, but man, I had a, I'm sorry, I had a bunch of questions for him. Hopefully, we can uh, 
finish that off if he can jump back in there. Um, but hopefully everything is okay over there. Uh, yeah, this is the studio. This is our studio view. Um, let me look at the comments. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we might be done. That might be our, the end of our show. If we can't get it back on, I'll see. Oh, he said session ended. Um, all right, let me send, I'm going to send him the link again real quick. And, uh, sorry about that. This is riveting, I know, to watch. I'm sorry. Um, I'll tell them the same one. He's going to... I know he has to go fairly soon because he has to leave, uh, drive up from... I think he's in Redondo to go up to uh, his studio in, like, Sherman Oaks. Um, let's see if this worked. Something just crashed. We love this uh, COVID stay away from people stuff. You get things like this happening. So we, he came in the studio before. We were hoping that he was going to be able to do it again, but we'll do it you know, somewhere down the road and uh, see if it's. Well, hopefully we get him on. Uh, let me look at the comments and stuff here real quick. Uh, Art wants to know, did Twitter cut P off? No, Art, uh, Twitter did not. Some some internet thing or something happened. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's see what else we got. He didn't pay his electricity bill. No, he said that something happened with his session. Um Uh, it's saying waiting to join some of a, uh, let's see. Yeah, it might not happen. I am very sorry. Um, let me see if I can, uh, apparently we cannot connect to him. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to have to probably end it there since it's not reconnected with him. But hope you guys enjoyed the conversation we had a half hour or so with uh, with Petros. Again, my apologies that uh, we, we lost him there at the end. Um, I'll try to get some – I'll try to put some stuff on the Peristyle, get him to answer some questions and stuff there. But um, that will end our show. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we will talk to you next time.